I am Mira Shanker. I work in the public engagement and communications team at Waterfront Toronto. Uh, we've had this display on here in the rotunda for the last two days uh, with some updates about Portland's flood protection. And tonight we're here with uh, members of our project team to give the latest update. Uh, I really want to thank those of you who came out. Again, um, I recognize the faces and for your you know, continued commitment to this project and interest in uh, learning more about the work we're doing and giving us the feedback that helps us make the projects even better. Um, I also want to just point out that um, you know a lot of our timelines on the boards are starting um, uh, you know in the 1970s and uh, talking about the industrial history of the Portlands. That's because uh, that's an important piece of the story that speaks to why the work that we're doing now is important and the challenges that we're helping to address. But it's also worth acknowledging that the Don River especially um, has of course been the site of human activity for much longer than that. Um, and so we acknowledge the land we're meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Metsi people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. And I'm going to ask uh, Councillor Paula Fletcher if she will come up and make some welcoming remarks. Thank you, thank you, Mira, and thank you to the Waterfront Toronto team and the city staff that have worked to bring this fantastic project to us. And I'm very happy that this has been in the rotunda for a number of days because the thousands and thousands of people that work in this building actually have got to see this transformation that will be taking place on Toronto's waterfront. And it's very fitting that it's here and that we learn about the beautiful park and also the 80 acres of residential mixed commercial at Villiers Island. And it's not in everybody's lifetime that you get to build a new river. No. Has anybody ever built a new river or know of a city where we've built a new river? This is a new river. And with the flood protection, realizing that the dawn in its current configuration is a danger to the community and to the safety of buildings in the Portlands and Leslieville, this new river course will mean that 100 year, 200 year, maybe even 50 year floods, the way it's happening right now, will not harm all of the businesses and those living in the neighborhoods. So it's a very exciting project that we're very pleased to be part of. I think it's a beautiful park. You see the cutaway. It is exciting, it's natural, it's going to be a space like no other in the city of Toronto. And David Kastirin is the river maker. He's down there making sure that that gets built on time and I think on budget, David? Yes, he's nodded, on budget. A $1.2 billion budget coming in on time on budget. Some fantastic river works, big infrastructure project in our city. And I just want to congratulate everybody who's brought it this far. Thank you very much for your great work. Um, and now, if we could ask uh, MP for Toronto Danforth, Julie DeBrusen, to come up and also say a few words. Thank you. Well, thank you to everyone who's come and who's shown an interest in seeing this project develop. It's been amazing over the past years to see as models change. And what this is, is a great example of what happens when the city, the province, the federal government and communities come together to build something together. And that's really what I've seen over time. It went, about a year ago, there was a presentation about Villiers Island, and it was all tall buildings, and there was no greenery. And, and the feedback was a lot of people said, we want to see what the parks are going to look like. What are the parks going to look like? And, and today's a great example of exactly seeing that, seeing what those public spaces are going to look like as well. And that comes from the feedback of people coming to meetings like this and all the other consultations. So it's been really amazing to see it grow. I can't wait to actually see and take a walk down in Promontory Park when it's done. I think it's going to be a beautiful place for us to explore together. I want to congratulate everyone for all of your hard work and to thank everyone for continuing to work to put this together. Thank you. Now I would like to ask Chris Klasik, our Chief Planning and Design Officer, to come up and give us a quick introduction and overview of the project.
So uh, this project, as has already been mentioned by a few people, has been going on for, for quite some time. It's had two real drivers behind it going back to the 1970s, as Mira said. Uh, one of them being to uh, bring some nature back to the Don River to restore some of the habitat that was historically part of the river, and the other to flood protect all of the lands uh, in the Portlands and in, in South Riverdale. And so what you see here in yellow is the, the boundary of the project uh, as we are working on it now, which is going to achieve both of those things, the naturalization and the flood protection. Um, it is basically just south of Corktown Common, which you see called out there towards the upper left. That is a park that sits on top of what is actually phase one of flood protection for the Don River. So that was uh, built by Waterfront Toronto and Infrastructure Ontario in the years leading up to the Pan Am Games, and that took out a huge area to the, to the west from the floodplain, but was always the first phase of what we are now finally doing as phase two, which is to take out everything uh, that's to the south and more or less within that yellow project area and even beyond that yellow project area. So how did we end up in this situation of, of flooding? There are several contributing factors. I think one is the river was engineered to do things it didn't really want to do uh, back in the early 20th century. And this is a map uh, that was produced at the time, actually, that shows you what the natural course of the river was with all of the meanders, uh, the way the river sort of found its way, found its comfortable route. It also would shift its location from time to time, and that's indicated here, too. And the best engineering thinking of the day back then was, we'll make it nice and straight, the water will flow fast, put it in a concrete channel, and you control it and you won't have a flooding problem, which they may not have had back then. But over the years, this entire watershed has become more densely built up, which means less water runs into the ground and more water runs into the river. We're now at a point where this river can very easily flood over the banks of this channel, so it really doesn't work anymore. And that's a big part of what we're doing. And you'll see in the plan that to some extent we're trying to put a bit of nature back we're taking the river out of its straight line and putting it back into a meander. It's a very engineered meander to make sure that we still won't have a flooding problem, but it's one that will allow nature to do some of what nature wants to do here. Um, and this is where the river went when it was put into that straight channel. This is the Keating Channel under construction. And it's the product of filling in what was the largest freshwater marsh on the Great Lakes, Ashbridge's Bay, which was about 1,000 acres of marsh. We're not restoring 1,000 acres of marsh, but we are creating um, about uh, 30 acres of a new wetland, which will be functional wetland. If any of you have been to Corktown Common, that project includes a, a recreated wetland that is actually a very thriving habitat. I was just there today, and I was just speaking with some residents who live near it, and they say you, the, the sound of frogs croaking at night is actually kind of loud in that, in that pond. And you can see ducks and you can see all the critters that you would associate with what would have been the wetland here before human intervention. And Herb Sweeney uh, from uh, Michael Van Valkenburg's office will talk to you about this uh, in more detail when I'm done. Um, there are several components to this project. It's a huge project, $1.25 billion worth of infrastructure and earthworks. And this map gives you a sense of the, the earthworks and flood protection components. So we have to dig a new river channel through the industrial land in the Portlands. We're creating the new landforms that will have Promontory Park and River Park North and South on top of them. The new uh, low flow channel, which will be the new main channel of the river, and then the Keating Channel will now be the spillway in storm events so that what we plant and build there doesn't get completely destroyed. Uh, letter D is actually what's historically been called the Don Greenway. Uh, that will be another uh, uh, wetland habitat that also serves as a, uh, a spillway in severe flood events. So once we've cut this new river channel through, we need some new bridges because we've now made it impossible to get across the river. So what you see here in purple are four new bridges that are being built as part of this project. Um, the one listed with the, uh, I think that's an O or a Q, um, in the upper left, replaces the existing bridge at Cherry Street that crosses the Keating Channel. Uh, we're rebuilding Cherry Street one block west of its current location keep the old bridge in operation while we build the new one and then we can get rid of the old one which is actually too low 
to handle the floodwaters in a storm event. South of that, we're building another bridge, which will go over the new mouth of the Don, roughly about where the TNT grocery store parking lot is, for those of you who know the TNT grocery store parking lot. And then to the east, we're building a new bridge for commissioners to connect across the new river channel. And then up in the upper right end, we're rebuilding the Lakeshore Bridge, widening it so that we can convey the flood volumes through there. So we're doing this massive earthwork project. We're also building four major bridges. Any one of these bridges alone is a large civil engineering project. We've got four going at the same time, more or less. Um, and then we also have to rebuild the streets because we're raising the grades by a meter to two meters in order to make sure that the new land is fully out of the floodplain. So the new Cherry Street is a completely new street built at a new elevation. Commissioners will have its grade changed and the Don Roadway will get completely rebuilt. And those are three rather major road projects that will have all of the infrastructure trunk servicing uh, for the new Villiers Island. And you heard the councilor mention the 80 acres. So in that uh, crook of that elbow between the uh, Cherry Street blue line going up and down and the Commissioner Street blue line going uh, across the bottom, all of that development uh, will take place in the future once we have flood protection. And that's about 80 acres of development, which makes this a fairly sizable community in its own right. Pretty comparable to the West Donlands uh, community, which is currently being finished uh, just up to the north. And then on top of all those earthworks goes a whole new series of parks. So we have 60 plus acres of green space that gets produced as part of this project. Some of it is wetland that is part of the riverine system, and then some of it is traditional parkland that's upland of the parks. And we have a fantastic model over there where you can see both of those things displayed um, in, that represent the area approximately where the L is on this map. We're uh, consulting with you now. This is actually uh, one of several consultations that we've held over the years on this project. The environmental assessment for this river project started in 2004. So we've been at this for 15 years now. Uh, but now we're in construction, so that's nice. We've done a series of pop-ups and focus groups. We've gone out into the community. Uh, we've held several public meetings. Um, to date, I think we estimate that we have connected with about 80,000 people through the public meetings and through our online um, uh, interaction. So a lot of folks have helped shape this project, and tonight is another step in the process, and we're hoping uh, to get um, some general feedback from you as we move forward. So where are we now? I think the last major public meeting we held on this project was about a year ago. It was in July of 2018. Um, I think it was actually in the St. Lawrence area. Um, we have now been continuing our design work, incorporating a lot of that feedback, uh, bringing these pro projects forward to our design review panel to make sure that we're on track with our uh, design objectives for this new neighborhood. Getting close to finishing the design of some of these pieces of infrastructure, some of which are already now starting in construction. And when you see the video at the end, you can actually see some of the work that's happening. So. Um, we're coming upon, we're at June 2019, uh, up here towards the right hand of the screen. And shortly we will have the design for all the roads done. And not too long after that, we'll have the design of all these parks done. Um, the parks are getting designed last because they will get built last once all the infrastructure is done underneath. So it's been a long process and uh, we appreciate your ongoing support and participation. This is a construction progress video. Now, Mira was uh, speaking with this going. So this is looking east, and you can see the outlines of the river. There are some uh, surface access roads that have been built for the construction that are kind of defining the new river valley. So you get a sense of the scale. And as the camera pulls back, you're now seeing Pulse and Slip, which will be the new mouth of the river. On the right-hand side is the Lafarge cement plant, which will stay more or less the way it is. But on the left, becomes a completely naturalized edge and incorporated into the park. You see the Atlas Crane, which you can see very prominently on the model. Uh, that will be incorporated into the naturalized areas of the river mouth that we are calling the Canoe Cove, uh, which creates a series of sheltered waterways um, for recreational boating and creates lots of opportunity for aquatic habitat. All of the edge there becomes part of the park. And as we come out farther, we're really into what we call Promontory Park where these different piles are of, uh, of, of material. As we start to pull around, this is where the park uh, will start to face the city and the grade will start to come up. 
And as we move to the left, you'll start to see the remnants of MT-35, which was the Marine Terminal Warehouse building that burned down uh, several months ago or a year ago now. Um, the building is being completely removed. It was not salvageable. We are retaining pieces of the building and we will be com <coughs> commemorating the building uh, in the park. And you can actually see the proposed commemoration uh, illustrated in the model. And where the building is is where the high point of the park will be. And you can see there's that's why we refer to it as Promontory Park because there's a kind of outlook that will get you up and enable you to really look out over the harbor and the islands. And then as we move farther to the left, you can see one of the two wetland coves that are being built as part of uh, the northern extension of Promontory Park. And you can actually see trees there. That's the kind of drowned forest, uh, which is a type of wetland condition that you would have seen here uh, in the sort of uh, early days of human settlement. And then the outlines of the lobe of Promontory Park North. And then just past that is the North Cove, which will also be a habitat cove. And this earthwork presents the landing spot for the new Cherry Street Bridge, for the newly aligned Cherry Street to get people from the mainland, as it were, onto Villiers Island. So that's kind of a very quick synopsis of where we are in the project. And I'd like to um, just very briefly introduce our speakers to give you the, who are going to give you the design update tonight. So we have Herb Sweeney from Michael Van Valkenburg's office standing over there. Uh, we also have James Roach from DTAH uh, who's working on the streets. And we have uh, Michael Machino from Intuitive who's working on the bridges. So you'll get an update on all three of those aspects of the project. So Herb, come on up. So yes, my name's Herb Sweeney. I'm from Michael Van Valkenburg Associates. We are the uh, leading the River and Parks Project um, here. So I think uh, first and foremost, uh, the Portland's project needs to deliver flood protection for nearly one third of the waterfront. And in doing so, um, we're reconnecting the Don River to the lake. And at that intersection between the urban waterfront and then the connection of the river, we have a great opportunity uh, to take the open space that's generated within the floodplain and the park system and really create Toronto's next great large urban park. In 2024, uh, we will have taken um, and transformed those contaminated um, brownfield and post-industrial brownfield sites to nearly 34 acres of aquatic and terrestrial habitat, um, in addition to another 11 hectares of park space. And um, some of the, the progress that the design team has uh, made since the last public consultation meeting um, that you can see in the, these two plans that are side by side, the one on the left here was the, the previous public consultation meeting that was back in July of last year. And the current design on the right, and this is the section uh, that Chris noted that we featured in the model that we brought here today. So this is the Promontory Park area. And Three of the, the major changes that you can see within um, the, the design evolution here is that we've greatly expanded the uh, main lawn, the central lawn that faces the inner harbor. Um, that's both to respond to uh, interests in using it for uh, informal recreation as well as uh, large events. Additionally, we've uh, included, increased the amount of water access points within the canoe cove. So, uh, the area at the very bottom of the screen. Um, it's quite tough to pick up on here, but the number twos. Um, so we've provided more opportunities to get down to that water's edge. Um, with a large cove, a large gravel beach area on the west side uh, of the island, and then another one on the east side closer to Cherry Street. And then one, the last major change to highlight here is that we've taken the um, the edge, the, the east side of the project, and we've brought the lawn area and connected it back to the Atlas Crane um, and reconfigured that cove. So we've really focused on uh, the Atlas Crane as amenity for the project. In uh, the previous public consultation meeting, we sp spoke quite a bit about um, the details of uh, the river system. And one of the things that we referenced was that uh, we've thought about how to design the river relative to the analog river mouse within the greater Toronto area, such as the, the Humber River photo here. 
And one of the important aspects of the river design was the, the upland forest that frames out uh, the new naturalized river, um, one in part for creating uh, a richer habitat, um, but also it's important for the park spaces because that forest frame will um, help hold the edge of the parks because right now um, the upland parks are leading the development uh, of the adjacent neighborhoods. So on day one, they have a big, very big role to play. And a lot of effort has been made into thinking about how the, the plantings will evolve over time. Um, so on day one, that condition at installation will be quite windswept, um, sun exposed. So we've looked at how um, through uh, natural succession of the plant material that we're selecting, in addition to an adaptive management strategy, that um, we can see that landscape over time evolve and set a trajectory that in year 20, year 30 down the, the, the road here, that it matures into a, a nice, in this case, a woodland forest um, for that forest frame that we're looking to create. There are several different uh, park planting types uh, that we're deploying uh, across the upland uh, park areas. Um, and they range from uh, larger openings in that forest frame uh, for those lawn areas that we're, we're seeking to have um, to some of these smaller gladed moments where we would have uh, both sun and shade maybe in areas where there are play um, components. To then um, one important aspect, and it's very hard to pick up on the screen, is we have a series of hedgerows that um, create a ribbon that go through the park. Um, both from a planting strategy, they help organize the site, but also from a uh, circulation strategy, and I'll touch on that a little later in the slide deck here. So I'm looking at those plant types. Um, so looking, starting in the top left, you can see an image of uh, what we describe as a grove where you could be in and amongst the trees, you have a canopy above you, uh, to some of the, the more open areas of the, the lawns and the gladed edges. Um, and that top right hand image is that hedgerow image that um, is quite an important component of this project um, and we'll touch on that in the circulation side here. Because it's a very long and linear uh, thin park, uh, what the area that is above top of bank. And um, we've thought quite a bit about how there's two primary paths of park circulation that stitch and, and tie this whole park system together. And in doing so, um, we're taking that uh, hedgerow planting type and really following the edge of this, uh, this path system, which is quite generous, civic in scale. It's five meters wide. Um, it starts to really define uh, how you move through the park. And then off of that main path is where we have programming. Um, so in this view, we're looking from the picnic area in River Valley Park North back towards the, the west. And here you can see the, the, that main path um, uh, on the left-hand side of the screen. And it runs out and takes your eye towards the Cherry Street South Bridge. Um, and that there would be various types of programming, park programming, that would be located off of that main path. Um, within that hedgerow, uh, it's important to note that there will be moments where you have sight lines down to the river valley, uh, drawing your eye deeper into the park, um, encouraging you to go explore down within the floodplain. Um, so we have a range of different park program types. The more intensive park uses, as we've talked about in prior consultation meetings, are located in Promontory Park, uh, so the west end of this project. And as you move from west over to the east, that intensity of uses starts to fall off as we get more down into the naturalized river channel and then down um, really to the, the Don Greenway, the spillway along the ship channel. Um, so looking at some of the programming types that are in Promontory Park South, we have that big event lawn um, that I touched on earlier. This is where that destination play area um, is located. Um, and one piece that we'll touch on are, is the, the opportunities for views um, with the promontory itself. And you'll see that in a later slide. And as you move farther to the east um, and more up river, you start moving into program types that are close, uh, more closely assimilated uh, with nature immersion. So the, the play areas become about nature play. We have large picnic areas, such as that rendering we just looked at. Um, and the lawn spaces are more about passive use recreation associated with picnicking and other um, uh, types of uses like that. Um, 
we have, over the last few months, looked at um, really putting emphasis on having year-round programming. Um, so not just the event lawn in the summer, um, or how we're getting, uh, how we are fulfilling the water recreation goals, but also how fire pits can be used both in summer months as well as in winter months. Um, that by programming the park with camps, uh, that we can extend uh, the, the use of those spaces and thinking about how the trail system can double as snowshoeing or cross-country skiing um, in the, the, the snowier parts of the year. So this is a view that's looking from that event lawn um, down west out to the inner harbor. Um, the event lawn has a, a range uh, from, it could be a, a movie night here where people have blankets out and are, are lounging. Um, up, it could seat upwards or, or um, provide space for upwards of 1,500 people um, in the space in a condition like this to if there was a more planned, organized event, we could have upwards of 8,000 people at standing room only and a big stage. It could be something for Canada Day or uh, another event that's planned for the space. There's nearly um, 1.2 million cubic meters of uh, soils that are being excavated out of the river channel. And that creates an, uh, a great opportunity um, for Promontory Park to be something that is really a landmark for the entire waterfront. Um, so there are the, the promontory itself, constructed out of some of those excavated river soils, will be at moments, uh, the walls along the promontory are about seven meters in height. Um, from this position, it, it will serve as a landmark for the entire waterfront. It will also create great opportunities and views back out to the downtown Toronto skyline as well as the Harbor Islands. And uh, the, the detailing, the, the, the concept behind the promontory is referencing um, the uh, escarpment just east of downtown Toronto, so the Scarborough Bluffs. And using technologies that look at earth form concrete walls, um, we're uh, looking to encapsulate those river excavation soils and create that, that high point. Um, so upwards of seven meters tall in some instances the wall. And trying to find opportunities that we can possibly incorporate bird habitat to help animate that face of the wall um, and bring nature really up into one of the more active areas of the park. Both within the, the Promontory Park area as well as the River Valley Park area, we have uh, play areas. Um, and uh, we're aspiring for a full range of play types within those areas. Um, from the nature play that would be located in the River Valley Park North um, to uh, having maybe a narrative play um, that is more about play structures um, to incorporating areas of water play and um, kinetic play being like a cable slide. One of the, the great opportunities of this project is to embrace both the industrial and natural heritage of this project. Um, so looking at the Keating Channel and the, the dock walls that are being retained there as part of uh, still maintaining the flood conveyance but also that there are other features within the park that we have opportunities to incorporate into the design. And a lot of thought has been given into how they're integrated within the naturalized river uh, valley system. So this view is looking east um, in the River Valley Park South from the Lower Don Trail. And here you can see that we've uh, salvaged um, part of the girders from the old Marine Terminal 35 building and repurposed them um, to build the bridge structure of the Lower Don Trail as it crosses one of our park paths. Um, in other instances, and clearly evident in the model right now, um, we've featured, uh, featured some of those heritage structures within the park. So off on the left-hand side of the view, you can start to get a glimpse of the Atlas Crane as you enter in off of Cherry Street. Um, and at the same time, that juxtaposition of this industrial artifact adjacent to the naturalized canoe cove, uh, we feel is a, a really, really strong um, message about the history of the site. We are making great efforts to provide uh, lots of opportunities for access um, to the water's edge, either through the trail network uh, itself that follows the levees along the naturalized uh, channel, um, to points where you can get down to the water. Uh, so we have water recreation access nodes. Uh, at some moments, those are bigger gravel beach, cobble beach areas that you can launch canoes and kayaks and paddle boards. Um, in other areas, they're more about fishing nodes, uh, rock outcroppings that get you closer to the, the water's edge. 
In this view, you can see um, one of those water access nodes, a gravel beach, um, on the top hand, right hand side of the image at the meander of the river bend there. And also um, some of those trails that are getting down into the floodplain. And in particular, um, there's been a lot of uh, focus on how to integrate the Lower Don Trail and extend that bicycle route down through the park system. Um, there's nearly four and a half uh, kilometers of uh, both bike trails um, and dedicated bike lanes as part of this project, both at the street level and within the parks. Um, the connection back up uh, north of Lakeshore Bridge uh, to the Lower Don Trail is about a meter, uh, one and a half kilometers of new trail that's being brought down and integrated within the park. And at this point, I'd like to uh, hand off um, the discussion to James Roach of DTH, and he'll talk more about the Roads Project. I am James Roach. I'm a partner at DTH, and we're working together with WSP on the design of the roads in the public realm. So there are three main streets for the Portlands. Uh, New Cherry Street, which extends from Lakeshore down to past Polson, and uh, Commissioner Street from New Cherry Street over to the Don Roadway, and then Don Roadway down to Commissioner Street. And the three streets will have uh, each have its own identity. Uh, New Cherry Street is seen to be more of an urban street extending down from the city into, uh, into uh, Villiers Island. And in the future, that will be framed by development on either side. Uh, the Commissioner Street, because of its adjacency to the park, will have more of a park feel. So we see the park extending uh, into Commissioner Street. And the Dawn Roadway from Lakeshore down to Commissioners will have more of a relationship with the river and with views to the river, uh, to Villiers Island, and to the park uh, to the south. To give you an idea of Cherry Street and the character we're looking at, we see Cherry Street as an urban green spine uh, with uh, planting uh, and uh, the use of open pit planters, sorry, on the, this is a view of the west side of the street. And you can see that there's a road, there's a, uh, a planted buffer, there's a Martin Goodman Trail, and that's separated from the pedestrian uh, realm uh, with another planting bed with lar hopefully large canopy trees. So the idea is to uh, take some of the stormwater from the Martin Goodman Trail and use that water and infiltrate it into and use it with the trees and the planting. Uh, there's also opportunity to have uh, the spaces that would be used for uh, site furnishing, bike parking, and as the neighborhood develops over time, kind of flexible spaces uh, for, the, for the future community. Uh, there's a bit of an example of some of the, the vegetation we'll be looking at. Uh, hardy trees that grow in an urban condition, locusts, freeman maples, uh, different uh, other plants with juniper and yarrow and perennial and grass mix. Uh, along the whole length. Uh, this is a view on the uh, looking southeast. This is on the east side of New Cherry Street looking uh, southeast. And you see the bridge in the distance, which we'll, the team will talk to in a few minutes. This gives an idea of the feel of the space. Again, very wide, three meter wide uh, pedestrian realm, a future development site uh, on the left of the screen. And uh, this is looking towards the Martin Goodman Trail on the other side. So you do have a transit lane another planted buffer, a road, and then the planting buffer, uh, Martin Goodman Trail, and another planting buffer. So trying to really uh, uh, take advantage of the, the width of the street to create uh, wide planting beds. On both uh, Cherry Street and Commissioner Street, uh, we will be looking at using uh, green infrastructure measures as much as possible uh, from native enhanced grass swales, bioswales, and the open pit planter uh, with openings to take the uh, rainwater and uh, to also reduce the amount of uh, pervious material. And the example on the left, again, with the Martin Goodman Trail using water and collecting water, uh, conveying to the, the open pit, and then taking excess water and again back into the system. And on Commissioner Street on the north side, we'll have uh, lay-by lanes where we can look at using porous asphalt. Uh, this is for more drop-off and pickup for people. Now, Commissioner Street as I mentioned, is a more of extension of the park. Uh, this is just a view of a portion of the street, and with the park uh, being designed by MVVA and Herb went through that, we see more of a, 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 the park informing the design of the south side of the park, 
bringing the canopy across, but having also a strategy for a canopy of columnar trees to just accentuate the kind of the commissioner street right across going east. On the north side of the street, we had, again, a three meter walkway, uh, and there would be planting strip and also the uh, eastbound bike trail, uh, sorry, westbound uh, 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 bike trail. And they would switch back and forth to accommodate the uh, lay-by, uh, pick-up drop-off lay-bys as well. Uh, so where we can, we have planting that would separate the cyclists from the pedestrian users or with seating elements as well. In, in the middle, we would have uh, also planting. And of course, on the south side, uh, we're looking at the possibility of having a, uh, the mid-block crossing. This would not be a signalized crossing. It's more of a safe haven crossing for people and cyclists to, uh, from Villiers Island coming down uh, to the park, but also there'll be crossings at the different uh, intersections. And this is a view uh, looking west along the south side of uh, Commissioner Street to give the, the idea of the feel of extending the canopy. I like to think it'd be more like a dappled light effect on the south side. It very much is a, a park street and with different access pathways into the park and a transit lane with stations a stop uh, at Munition Street and of course the road on, on the north side. The third street, the Don Roadway, again with the, the design would be focused more on the River Valley edge. Uh, this is a view looking east, not towards the river right now. Uh, again, the idea would be to use a, a planting to separate planting and seeding elements uh, to separate uh, the, uh, the bike trail, uh, Lower Don uh, River Trail coming down. It's roughly 3.6 meters wide. And we'd have the uh, pedestrian kind of promenade along the river's edge coming south. And then you would have an entranceway into the park that Herb uh, mentioned. The river is basically right along this edge and uh, again, the grading will allow for the planting of the park and then entrance into the park. Uh, the further south you go to the commissioner intersection. Uh, future connections to the east, once we have a future connection uh, past the Don Roadway. The east side of the uh, street would be a temporary landscape, more of a naturalized landscape. Uh, we have the existing uh, towers, hydro towers along that side. And the, we coordinated with the park, parks team on the planting for uh, the River Valley Edge, looking at uh, different uh, shrubs uh, and uh, tr uh, trees with trembling aspen, white pine, red oaks. Again, each street will have a kind of a different character for the planting, but working together with the, uh, the parks team. And the last uh, slide I wanna show is just the, on the west side of the uh, Don Roadway looking south Again, as I mentioned, you have the, the, the grade changing here and flaring out into the park entranceway. You have a, a pedestrian thoroughfare, a lookout, uh, seating elements, and then the trail coming down on the uh, east side of the planting there, and then the road with the east side, you can see the distance with the hydro towers. So this would allow for uh, different window views into, uh, into the site, to the river, to Villiers Island, and to the bridge on the south side on Commissioner Street here. So with that said, I'm gonna pass over to uh, Mike to talk about the bridges and uh, any questions later on, we can answer questions regarding the roads. Uh, good evening, my name is Mike Machino. I'm with uh, uh, Intuitive, principal with Intuitive, and uh, we were tasked with designing the bridges. And uh, the mandate that we were given is to actually develop bridges for, with two main criteria in mind. Uh, Waterfront wanted us to develop uh, bridges which were really uh, modern and uh, reflected the, the um, high-tech character that the Portland's community will eventually become. And they also wanted the three new bridges to, re to relate to each other, to work as a family of bridges. And so what we did was we, we worked with a, basically a curved or an arched uh, shell type structure and then started to remove material so that what was left uh, was sort of an elegant uh, dynamic shape that really reflected the flow of the structural forces. And this is what you see in front of you. Uh, the bridge decks are hung up to the shell structures through a series of plate hangers. And again, we tried to minimize the number of hangers to one 
uh, create openness of the bridges. We want it to be a very open looking structure and to, to emphasize more the shell form, which is really the, the main uh, focus of the, of the bridge structures. And so you can see how each of the, each of the three bridges is a little bit different. They all, the spans are a little bit different. So Cherry North is a single span structure. Cherry South is a three span structure. And uh, Commissioners is actually a four span structure. Uh, the decks, or at least sorry, all the bridges have room for vehicles, bicycles, and pedestrians. And at Cherry South and at Commissioners, the sidewalk area actually bows outward. Uh, it's on the outside of the bridges. It bows outward so that it, to create lookouts so people can actually stop and enjoy views of the river or the city, looking back at the city, or the parkland. Um, we're also looking at the bridges right now in terms of developing uh, themes for the bridges. So right now we're trying to dub colors. Each bridge will have a different color so that uh, each one will be unique in that aspect. So not only its location but also the color. You might go and stop. Let's go meet at the red bridge or at the yellow bridge. And so that's something that we're developing right now. Uh, where we are in the process, all of the structural steel has been now tendered and awarded and is now in fabrication. So the, the double curved shell plates are actually being fabricated in the Netherlands, and then they're gonna be shipped over to Nova Scotia where a fabricator will assemble the, the bridge pieces. Actually, the entire bridge will be fabricated as a single piece for Cherry North, and three pieces for Cherry South, and four pieces for commissioners. And those large sections will be floated on barges along the seaway and then erected at the site. Uh, this is a view uh, looking north towards Commissioner Street Bridge. You can see the, the two spans uh, in the background, you can see the colors on the inside surface of the of the shell. What we're hoping to achieve here with the, the colors and the, and the form again is the shell will form a very sort of clean, uh, sleek look, uh, very simple, but very elegant, we hope, in, it, in its shape and the colors giving it some extra, um, extra character. And here's a view of the Cherry Street North Bridge. Uh, Cherry Street is the one location where we're going to be uh, building both road and uh, BRT or LRT bridge. Uh, at the other two locations, we're building just the road bridge for now, and there'll be uh, provisions made for uh, future erection of the uh, LRT bridges. And finally, here's a view of uh, Cherry Street South Bridge, again over the river mouth, emptying out into the river. You can see the crane in the background, and again, uh, you can see again how the different colors give the bridges also their own uh, unique character. So apparently there's a green screen at the back. Anyone who wants to have their picture taken can, can do so. Uh, this is an image of some of the some of the uh, people on the team and their families have uh, taken some pictures and, and this is the result. Thank you very much to the team for that update. Um, and we'd like to open it up to questions. I'll be a roving mic, so if you do have a question, just raise your hand and I'll come over to you with the microphone. Um, there's a tremendous amount of vegetation coming into this area. I wonder, have you done an inventory of the wildlife that they're going to need to sustain it from slugs and snails to songbirds and gophers and goodness knows what else. But, um, you know, for the soil to live, for the plants to survive, you've got to have active animal life. Is anybody taking care of that aspect? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think we, uh, we feel as though, the, yes, there, that is all important about making a functioning ecosystem. Um, you need all of those inputs, um, and we're going to great lengths with um, the plant selection, um, the soil design, the amendments that are going into the soils um, to be to lay the foundation for that system to uh, be able to function. We feel that with the uh, close proximity to the, the the Don Valley itself and Tommy Thompson Park, that some of that wildlife that you noted um, will certainly come. You build it. Uh, it will come. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that question. I've uh, got one here. One thing I forgot to mention is if you'd like to introduce yourself to our members of the design team when you're asking your questions, please go ahead. Hi. Um, oh, closer. Um, I'm Lily. Hi. Um, I have two questions for the for uh, the gentleman who was working on the roads and one question related to the bridges. Um, so regarding the roads, um, I noticed that you have a lot of trees in the middle uh, separating and, and uh, buffers around. I'm a little concerned that if the tree trunks are 
trees themselves and the foliage might uh, hide uh, the differences between uh, the pedestrians, bikes, and cars. So for example, where the crosswalks are in particular. So if you have a tree that's covering, that's hiding your pedestrian crosswalk, right. will they be able to see? Okay. So when, when we do our layout for a plantain plan, we take in consideration all the traffic triangles as well. And uh, to make sure the design is safe, we're not going to propose uh, uh, any kind of plantain that's going to be a hazard or obscure views. Okay, so. cool. Um, and f regarding Commissioner Street, because currently Commissioner Street is very, um, is used mostly by industrial trucks um, that go to and from all the industrial factories that are along Commissioner Street. Um, I was curious to what kind of, can the pavers sustain that much rolling from heavy loads from those trucks? Or are you anticipating that the trucks will be di diverted before reaching the park area? Uh, that's probably more a w um, So, I'm sorry, your first part there was the material of the road, you said? You asked? Uh, um, well, it, I, I understand the traffic pattern, but you're asking also the materiality of the road? Or you, well, it's, it's mostly because Commissioner Street, since it it's a road that is used to having a lot of heavy loads from the trucks that are yes. made for industrial work. Yes. Um, because it's heavier than your usual pavement so, streets right. in the residential So both, both the roads, uh, all the roads have to be designed to take trucks and take heavy trucks. Uh, you will have traffic coming down Cherry, but you also have traffic coming down the Don Roadway. Uh, a lot of the larger trucks, I'm understanding, will be diverted down Don Roadway. Okay. But that's a more of a detailed question for WSP. But. Okay, and uh, lastly, regarding the bridges, um, will they be tall enough to to support um, the large freight ships, uh, shipping container boats, who will need to use that crane that is being so prominently displayed? Shipping underneath, underneath, underneath oh, shipping underneath the bridges, you saying? Yeah. Um, at Cherry North, there's enough room to get. Um, the sediment management barges will be you know, running along Keating Channel and going underneath. So that, that clearance has been provided for. Um, large uh, freight type uh, ships, they're not uh, designed for that. It wasn't really meant for that. It wasn't part of the mandate actually for the, for the project. We can, if you have a specific follow-up question about the, the bridges and the flow of sort of marine traffic through, definitely we can chat afterwards in more detail because I think there, it depends on what you're kind of trying to, trying to understand about it. So come, come find a member of our team after and we can chat a little, in a little bit more detail about that. Hi, my name is Ola Calder and I'm a Corktown resident. It's about the first section and the main pathway that was uh, shown. I'm a little surprised that at the uh, western edge of it, it was put on a, a horizontal directly from the top of Promontory Park South over to the roadway when we've been led to believe all along that this would be a continuation of the overall waterfront trail system. So something that from the walkways on the north side of the Inner Harbour, um, those edges, the, the water's edge there, that water's edge walk promenade would come across uh, the promenade park north and then down into there. And I presume that still will, but it seems a lot to me that you would highlight that section while we're also not seeing any idea of what the future is of Promontory Park North. Is that, is that interrelated in some way? That, is there a reason why that's deliberately being left out of all of the pathway discussion? Yes, um, th that's a good question. So um, the Promontory Park North part of this project um, is, sorry, the Promontory Park North area is not part of this project. So that is to be funded um, in the future. It's not part of the flood protection project. So we, um, as you noted, we are not making a connection across the Keating Channel and back up to uh, the waterfront trail. When that project comes along in line in the future, that will connect um, with the trail. And then it will also, um, let's see if I can get this to work where that connection comes, whether it becomes a bridge connection across the promontory, it will then tie back into that promenade that we have and back into the, the main park system uh, that comes down to the south here. 
correct. It's so not part it, of the project budget. Yeah. So in terms of what's what is and isn't part of the project, um, the the scope of this project that was determined through the due diligence study that we did includes uh, the parks and roads and bridges that we've been talking about tonight. Some of the other spaces, um, you may have seen some images of them at previous meetings because the team actually took those um, up to 30% design just to make sure that uh, we were able to create a cohesive full plan for the area. And the expectation is that uh, with along with future development, Promontory Park North and Villiers Park on the other side of Villiers Island will, will come um, and some of those connections as well, right? So again, if, we, if you have more questions about that, we can take a look at the maps and kind of walk through what exactly that means and how that could work. Um, or if you want to ask a follow-up question now. Well, kind of. Aren't you, aren't you concerned then that Promontory Park South for its early days is kind of isolated and cut off from the rest of the world? Until future development comes along, we can't make that physical connection along the waterfront edge. Um, still, at the same time, there will be public transit that runs down Cherry Street and down along Commissioners. The current bus route um, does lead you back down, and there are stops uh, that have been uh, planned for, and they are, you can see them in some of the boards. Um, and then we feel that also that the opportunity of the bicycle routes that we've provided is, is a pretty good connection. Um, by tying both into the Martin Goodman Trail and tying into the Lower Don Trail, um, we're anticipating that, yes, it will change with time, uh, the tenants and visitors, but we still will have, um, we're hoping, a pretty good draw on day one. Thanks. It's really beautiful. Can't wait. Um, for my neighbors in the distillery in St. Lawrence, we're very much looking forward to Promontory Park North and the footbridge at the bottom of Trinity. And I'm concerned that people who live very close to the north end of where that bridge would be uh, will choose to drive down Cherry Street to get to the park. And I would hate to see you have to put in a parking lot. Um, so I just want to, on behalf of my neighbors, say to everyone, anything we can do to get that north park constructed and the bridge especially so that it's accessible will be very much welcomed by its neighbors. I think more of a comment than a question, but I also appreciate it, and thanks. Um, questions? Any other questions around this corner? Right in front of me. <laughs> uh, my question is regarding, you're making four bridges and creating an island, and you're putting all these trees and wildlife and everything, and you're going to have wildlife. What provision has been made to get them o across there without being roadkill on these bridges? <laughs> so the question is, they get, getting the wildlife under the bridges? Over the, I'm not quite sure. I... We're not getting them over the bridges. We have connections, and it's, it's not legible on the drawings. Um, but we do have connections down under the bridges where we have open space that sneaks down under the bridges. Um, so as far as a wildlife corridor, I would envision that as wildlife is moving, if it's not birds or something that can fly over the bridges, they move along the shoreline and make that connection. Um, Commissioner's Bridge, uh, Chair Street Bridge South, they all have connections underneath from a park perspective within the floodplain. Sorry, didn't, didn't understand does, that does question that first, your question? but that makes sense. Yes. After, since they put the cement barrier in the middle of the Don Valley quite a long number of years ago, there's been an awful lot of roadkill. They get across the road, they get confused, they turn around and go back, and they get flattened. Um, hi, my name is Ting. Uh, I'm curious about the green infrastructure that are going to go into place. Um, what I'm just wondering about some of their design considerations. Like, are they meant to absorb rainfall on some specific area? Like, what is the ratio of um, absorbent landscaping and impervious. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, the question. Okay, I, I don't have the detailed numbers of the percentage, but I mean, uh, the we're deploying uh, these elements throughout Cherry Street and Commissioners. Uh, some are not on Commissioners, some are on uh, Cherry Street. Uh, it's really kind of best practices, and given the fact that over time, with global warming as such, we just want to reduce the amount of heat island effect, but also to uh, reduce 
the amount of water that goes into the, the storm system and there's a chance here to capture that as much as possible with overflow into the system. Uh, we could probably talk afterwards about more detail with uh, WSP as well and talk about more of the kind of the numbers afterwards. Great. Thank you so much. Um, if you still have questions or if you want to really dig into detail, like I can tell some of you do based on your questions, we have members of the project team here uh, from Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, from City of Toronto, Waterfront Toronto, MVVA, DTH, WSP, Intuitive, um, and they're all um, stationed uh, in, in front of their, their uh, boards uh, near material that's relevant to the work that they're doing on this project. So please stick around. You have another half an hour or so to take a look at the material, to check out the model, and also, as Mike pointed out, to get your photo taken in front of our green screen so you can be transported into the future Promontory Park. So thank you again so much, everyone, for coming tonight.